Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome this morning. As we start, I'd like to start with reading a psalm that I often think of when I think of coming together for a service. If you'd like to join with me, um, it'd be great if you'd read with me. So Psalm 100, I'll give you a moment to find it in whatever device or book you're using to uh, get your uh, biblical input and i'm reading off a app so i'm already there and ready let me read psalm 100 a psalm for thanksgiving <clears throat> shout joyfully to the lord all the earth serve the lord with gladness come before him with joyful singing Know that the Lord himself is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his course with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name for the Lord is good. His loving kindness is everlasting and his faithfulness to all generations. Well, this morning as I was thinking about the service, yeah, it, it occurred to me that it's so different at the moment, the way we are coming together. And, and it's a temptation for us to approach the service differently and not to have the same mindset as if we were meeting together as we used to a few months ago. And I think we must be careful not to let that be the way we meet and that our mindset is still one where we're coming together to worship the Lord and honor Him in this time so i'd like you to join with me as we do that this morning and that we would just just keep in mind who we are to to honor and to to glorify and that it is really in his service that we meet together this morning so uh, i'd like to welcome pastor mark who's here again this morning thank, thank you for that i saw he was here he had a few words to say a moment ago you probably saw him so i know he's here um and he'll be leading the uh, the service a bit later but i think we're uh, we've got a, a song coming up cal if i'm right so if you join in that
Amen. As we go into a time of prayer now, uh, we've got Pastor Jim and then Walter and Alec. Um, Pastor Jim, if you're ready. All right, sure. Let's pray. Father God, we just come to you this morning. First of all, Lord, we want to praise you. Praise you, God, for your glory, Lord, your wisdom that we see in your word. And Father, your power, you're able to protect us and watch over us and your plan, Lord, for the ages that we've been learning about. Father, we just praise you, God, for who you are this morning. Lord, we also want to thank you for your protection, Lord, for your provision, how you've met our needs. And, and then, Lord, for your mercy and grace that made our salvation possible. And Lord, we praise you and thank you for those things. And Lord, as we come before you as a church this morning, we pray for you, first of all, God, that you would help us to, to know you more, to love you more, and to trust you more. And then, Father, as we gain more knowledge of you, as we love you more, I pray, Father, then that you would help us to, to show that love by being a church that obeys you, that follows your word, and that shines your light bright so others can know you. Father, we pray for our uh, Bible studies and discipleships that are still taking place over social media, that God, you would continue to, to give us wisdom as pastors on how to do that. And, and Lord, for each of us, that we would take part in those things and just rejoice in the ability we have to study the word together. And Father, as we think of our needs as a church, we also pray, Lord, for those who are struggling, those who are without work during this time. I think of Sipokazi too and her family as they're struggling because she has to uh, stay home do, and quarantine due to the coronavirus. Lord, we pray that you would be with her and her family. Uh, she asked for prayer, too, for her family that doesn't know you as their Savior, that they would come to know you. Lord, we pray for Son and her family who uh, are without work, and also for Peter and Wilma, as Peter lost his job and now has found out that Wilma is pregnant. So, Father, we rejoice in the gift of life that you've given them, but, Father, we pray that you would meet their needs physically. And Lord, I'm sure there are many others that we can mention who are without work or, or reduced work. And Lord, we pray that you would meet their needs. Father, we pray for uh, Tabaho, who's in the Eastern Cape for the funeral of his cousin sister. We pray, God, that you would just help him to be able to share the gospel while he's there. And Lord, bring him home safely. Father, we think of Hilbert and Ann's request for their granddaughter, Tara. She's been sick now for several days. We pray, God, that it's not the coronavirus. And we pray that you also would protect Kira from that and that you would watch over her. Lord, we pray for some Pee Wee son and Tondo, that you would just watch over him. And uh, Lord, give some Pee Wee protection. As he says in the squatter camp, very few people are taking this virus seriously, wearing masks and those kind of things. And he's asked for prayer for protection from that. And Lord, we also pray for those who we know who have the coronavirus, that Father God, you would be with them. We pray God, first of all, that they know you as their savior. And Father, that you would use this to bring glory to your name. Father, we love you and we need you today as a church. Lord, continue to guide us, I pray. Help us, Lord, to keep you first in all that we do. And help us, Lord, to seek to glorify you and point others to Christ. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this good day that you've made. And we, we praise you that you are in control, even of our government and governments all over the world. Uh, today we pray for our government, um, in this time especially, but um, remind us to do that uh, often and faithfully. Uh, we pray and because we know that many or most of them do not know you, and uh, they might be seeking after their own glory. Um, but we come to you, and you that appoint kings, and hold them in your hand and um, and also are in control of our lives we pray that you will uh, guide their decisions um, and that you will if there are voices that and people that know you that they will be a voice for you that you will give them wisdom and to be bold and um, fearless also in this time and that you will protect your children also in government and in whatever level they may be. Help them to be uh, faithful witnesses even in this time. And that you will save um, some also in our government. And um, we pray that you will guide their decisions, um, even though they do not look for you uh, for wisdom. And, um, and even if they have plans that, that are not of you, 
and that are against your children and against this country even. But that uh, we pray for your protection and we pray for our children, Lord, that um, will live in this country for years to come and even ourselves. Um, Lord, as, as you said, that we must pray so that we can have a quiet and peaceful life. We know we're not building a kingdom here on earth, but you asked, um, you told us to pray like this. So please protect us and um, we pray for our economy that's really in a bad state. And we pray for our police and that they will not um, abuse their power and even government officials. And um, uh, we pray for the schools and, and all the, um, not only there, but all the chaos and all the uncertainty in this time, Lord Jesus, that you will um, guide us as parents and um, heads of homes and um, give us your wisdom, Lord Jesus, also to guide and to lead our, our own families and also local government, um, that you will also um, help them in caring for those that are sick and protecting us. Please give them wisdom and um, and the day through this, also some of them might come to know you and acknowledge that you are God. Lord Jesus, then help us also in this time to see uh, where and how we can be uh, witnesses. Help us, Lord, at work, where we go in the shops and where we walk, um, to, to look out for our neighbors. We pray for them, Lord Jesus, that they might come to know you. And uh, thank you for your glorious gospel and that you've reached us and help us to look around uh, to find ways and means um, as you direct us also to share this wonderful news. Thank you for your goodness, Lord Jesus. Thank you for this time together. We pray that you will be glorified in everything. Amen. Well, have you got Alex uh, recording? Praying for the ministries uh, of God. Let us close our eyes. <clears throat> Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray, we thank you, Lord, for everything that you keep on doing, for not being, for not failing us, for keeping with us. Lord Daniel uh, once prayed in, in his books, said, Oh Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his awesome covenant of love with all who love him and obey his word. We have sinned and done wrong. We have been wicked and have rebelled. We have turned away from your, your word and the laws. Lord, we, 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 we ask forgiveness from you, first of all. We never stray, we is not straight. We thank the Lord Jesus Christ who died for us who died in our place, who rose again for our place, who have taken away our sins. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for your redemption. We thank you, Lord, for your blood. You almighty God, you are awesome God. You always powerful. You never fail. You never forsake us. You never leave us. Lord, now I pray this morning, but Lord, please, Lord, show yourself that you still care, even in this time, by giving us grace, giving us joy, giving all these ministers joy. Uh, let us all recognize your grace through this hard time, even if you're not delivered from the problems of this pandemic, or from the problem of financials, from the type of problems uh, that we have uh, as, as the churches. 
Lord, we pray to you, and then we ask you, Lord, that keep on supplying to the church, supply the healing, supply the strength, supply the, the, the strong faith uh, during these times, Lord. Lord, we pray for brothers Timbiso uh, in Deben. Lord, I pray that you strengthen him, you give him courage, you help him to give others the courage. Uh, Pukina Guinea, brother Lawrence, I pray, Lord, that, Lord, you keep on sustaining you, doing the same to you. Uh, let them all keep on preaching, having a stability and all the strength they need to share the gospel, to reach to the Lord's souls as we ought to do so in faith fellowship with my pastors. Lord, I pray that you also strengthen them, you lift them up every morning, every second, every day. Lord, let me like this, nothing like a pandemic uh, to them as they ought to strengthen each and every one of us by your spirit, by your word, by your truth, uh, not by anything else that is came from the main mind, but a thing that has come from you. Lord, we pray for the brothers down there in, in the strength, a blue downs. We pray for all of them, Lord, that, Lord, you give them a courage, you sustain, you sustain, make them stand firm, you make all of us stand firm, uh, in each and every individual, in each and every church that we, we, we fellowship with, each and every Baptist church that we fellowship with, Lord, I pray that you give each and every one a courage to serve you, to love you, to show out your love, the love that you have planted in us. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for, for, for this moment, for this time, for even for the, 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 this morning that you gave us. It's all from you, Lord. We know. We, we don't know how, how, how many days we can live, which day that we can be gone in this earth. But praise God, praise you, Lord, that if we're gone in the earth, we're still going to live with you. It's not the end to us. Oh, Lord, we say a hallelujah to that. Thank you, Lord, for this moment of prayer that you give me. Lord, I pray that, Lord, you hear uh, this prayer, Lord. I pray that, Lord, you... Uh, help me to be humble uh, before you every time I come in front of you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ Lord give us strength today give uh, give, give, give my pastors to share the, the, the message clearly as you lead them as you fill them with your Holy Spirit let you speak in them and let us only hear you as they pour the message that is from you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, Lord, thank you. I pray. Amen. Amen. I'm going to Mike read uh, some scripture to us now. It's, um, it's Exodus 19. Mike, are you there? Can you hear me? All right. Good morning, everyone. Can now, yes. Okay, we're, we're in Exodus 19, 9 to 25. The Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will come to you in a thick cloud, so that the people may hear when I speak with you, and may also believe in you forever. Then Moses told the words to, of, the, of the people to the Lord. That all, the Lord also said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their garments and let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down on Mount Zion in the sight of all the people. You shall set bounds for the people all, all around saying, beware that you do not go up on the mountain or touch the border of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. Sorry. No hand shall touch him, but he shall surely be stoned or shot 
through wherever beast or man. He shall not live where ram's horn sound. A long blast, they shall come up to the mountain. So Moses went down from the mountain to the people and consecrated the people, and they washed their garments. He said to the people, Be ready for the third day. Do not go near a woman. So it came about all on the third day, when it was morning, that there were thunder and lightning and flashes and a thick cloud upon the mountain and a very loud trumpet sound, so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. <clears throat> Verse 18. Now Mount Zion was all in smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire, and its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked violently. When the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him with thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Zion to the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, Go down, warn the people, so that they do not break through to the Lord to gaze, and many of them perish. Also let the priests who come near to the Lord consecrate themselves, or else the Lord will break out against them. Moses said to the Lord, The people cannot come up on Mount Zion. For you warned us, saying, Set bounds about the mountain and consecrate it. Then the Lord said to him, Go down and come up again, you and Aaron with you. But do not let the priests and the people break through to come up to the Lord, or he will break forth upon them. So Moses went down to the people and, and told them, Thank you. <clears throat> Pastor Philip, will you pray for giving? I just want to read to you. Good morning, everyone. I just want to read a few verses from 3 John, verse 5. Beloved, you are acting faithfully in whatever you accomplish for a bread, <coughs> and especially when by our strangers. And they have testified your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. For they went out for the sake of a name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support such men, so that we may be fellow workers with the truth. So let's just take some time to pray for our giving. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege we have of giving some giving to you, Father, and worshipping you through our giving. And so, Father, we thank you for all those funds that have come in and are coming in. And we do pray, Father, and thank you that we can be partakers of your work that others are doing as we support them. And as we give to your work, Father, we pray that you will bless it, that you will use these funds for your glory and for your honor. And we thank you for the privilege of worshiping you in this way. In Jesus' name, we thank you. Amen. Amen. We have a uh, slide of music now. <laughs> Could we 
We're going to Pastor Mark. Thank you, Pastor Mark. Uh, I guess you're going to take over the screen again, so I'll leave that between you and Cal. All right. Are we on, I guess? Uh, it says I'm on. Good morning. We invite you to take your Bibles this morning. We're going to talk about the subject of awe. A W E awe, the glorious versus the most glorious is the actual title to the message. And uh, to get us started, uh, I want us to take our Bible and turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7. And I'm going to uh, try to put this up on the screen here. Uh, I think this is going to have to go away, uh, the screen I have of you guys. I have your thing, David's iPad up there. Okay, so I'm going to hit mine. Okay, the host has to do this, not me. Whoever the host is, it says disabled attendee screen sharing. So... Let's see, host of the mostess, if you would do that. And I don't think it's working yet, but if you're at 2 Corinthians chapter 3, well, we solve this problem. Um, I still have David's iPad up here. I don't have my outline for you. So, um, not the host of the I am saying screen share again. There we go. Got it this time. All right. Uh, we should be up there now, and you should have it, I would think. Um, maybe. Yes, yes, we have it. Thanks. All right. Very good. Well, you've got the scriptures in front of you, at least with the New King James Version, but you can use whichever version you'd like. And uh, we want to talk about this glorious versus most glorious issue. And I want to explain, this is just my introduction. We're actually going to be looking at Hebrews. But this lays the groundwork for what we're going to um, talk about. 
And of course, your scripture reading from Exodus 19 also laid the groundwork. I thank you for that, Cal, uh, and for those who read it, um, because um, it does lay the groundwork. So let's read verse 7 through 11, at least. But if the ministry of death, written and engraved on, stone, on stones, so the ministry of death is the law, all right? And this is the, the message of the glory of the old covenant, uh, the other term for the law. But if the ministry of death, or you could replace that with law or with the old covenant, written and engraved on stones was glorious, and we know it was, so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away. And he's referring not only to the glory on Moses' face, but he's drawing a picture of what's happening to the law. How will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? So if you notice my title, I, I didn't say more glorious, I said most glorious. So let's go a, a little bit further down in verse 9. For if the ministry of condemnation... That's the law which condemned us, uh, had glory. The ministry of righteousness in Christ Jesus exceeds much more in glory. So again, the comparison of the two. For even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect. So relatively, if you, if you compared the glory of what happened on Mount Sinai with the glory of Calvary and with the glory of the the coming Mount Zion that we're going to read about, uh, they just have no comparison. And that's what his point is. Even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect, relatively, because of the glory that excels. If the new glory is so wonderful, so stupendous, so amazing, then it just pales the other one into insignificance. And that's what happens here with the new covenant shining forth with truth in a way that uh, frees and saves and gives purpose to life and opens our uh, eternal relationship with our Father. The, 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 um, the New Testament uh, message is so glorious. It excels anything. And and anything before it that might have seemed glorious at that moment will not seem glorious anymore to you if you think about it. For if what is passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. So I've said with much more glorious, excels, exceeds much more. Uh, I've taken the words and I've given it my own meaning, most glorious. Glorious versus most glorious. Therefore, verse 12, since we have such hope, such amazing, glorious hope, we use boldness, some versions say, plainness, other versions say, and I would like to say the Greek would allow me every freedom to use this word. We use simplicity. We use simplicity. So plainness or simplicity, uh, of speech. Unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away, but their minds were blinded. For until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. You know, I, I sometimes feel, and, I, and this is a little bit of a complaint as a pastor, I sometimes feel that, that we're acting like Moses, that we're putting a veil over the gospel. In, in, in the next chapter, Paul says, if we hide our lives, he says this in verse 3 and 4, if we hide our lives and our witness is hidden, we're doing what Moses did. And, and sometimes we do that, and we need to evaluate this. This is not what the sermon's about. This is free along the side. We need to just evaluate whether we're cooperating with the simplicity. 
whether we're uh, with the with the plainness of the gospel, uh, whether we can really say we're being bold, or are we being shy, or are we being reserved, or are we being complex, or are we being complicated, or are we being withdrawn? And, and when people don't see Jesus in us, and when we don't explain Jesus in us, uh, being in us, then the result, and it really is a, a dangerous result, is that our family, our friends, our neighbors, they don't get to know the Lord as their savior. And so I just would remind you and ask you to consider whether you're acting a little bit like Moses. Let's just review now. What have we seen? We've seen that this wonderful gospel message is more glorious than the old covenant. And we've made the point that if it's so glorious, then we mustn't hide it. The reason God revealed it in this glorious way was so that people would see the light, not so that we could bury the light under a bushel. So he goes on. In verse uh, 16, we're reading of uh, 2 Corinthians 3, 16. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord, now the Lord is the Spirit. And this rever re refers back to verse 7. Listen to uh, verse 8. Listen to verse 8. How will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? Hear that in verse 8? Now listen to it again. Now the Lord is the Spirit. Verse 17. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed, transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. The name, the Spirit of the Lord, just keeps coming through this because that's the message of the New Covenant. The New Covenant offers us many things, many blessings, but the primary blessing it offers us is the Holy Spirit of God working in our lives, changing us, and making us more in the image of our Savior, Jesus Christ. So that's just as introduction. And as the scripture reading of Exodus 19 was introduction, and this is introduction, now I invite you to go to the actual sermon, which is in Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Now, now I want to take you to a mountain. Now, it may seem that that's a strange thing to do, but we need to uh, understand that these two mountains picture, they, they represent the time up ahead uh, the, after the rapture, the time of what God is planning. So God, if you were to say, uh, what did God plan before grace? I could say to you in summary, he planned a mountain, and that would be Sinai. And if you said to me, and what has God planned for us during this time? I would say that we would set in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, which would be another mountaintop experience. And if you were to say, well, what's up ahead? I'll say a third mountain. Mount Zion is the third thing that we're headed to and that we're going to. So very important that we, um, that we understand these three things, all right? So first of all, we're going to look at two mountains. And let me move this along uh, so you can see the two mountain outline and follow with me a little bit better. The two mountains, Sinai and Sion or Zion. And the first one is the terrifying mountain. The terrifying mountain is the mountain you read about in Acts chapter, I mean, in, fact, in Exodus chapter 19. And now we're reading about it in verse 18 of chapter 12. So let's read in verse 18 of chapter 12. For ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched, and that burned with fire, nor into blackness and darkness and tempest. Now, very important that uh, we stop and just think about that picture of what you read back in Exodus. And the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, which voice 
they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. In other words, they said, don't, don't, we don't want to hear from God. That's what they're saying. We do not want to hear from God personally. We're afraid of him. Moses, you go talk to God. You tell us what he said. They were afraid to talk to God. That's a, a terrible condemnation on the children of Israel at that time. For they could not endure, verse 20, that which was commanded. That's why they didn't want to hear the word of the Lord. When I say I don't want to hear the word of the Lord, it's because I don't want to do it. And if so much, I remember as a little boy, my mother would say, did you take the, the trash out, the dustbin out? And I would say, uh, no, I forgot. Well, didn't you hear me remind you? <laughs> you know, I had this selective memory. I, I this selective hearing. Um, now, now I'm, you know, uh, slightly over uh, 17 now or 74, whatever it is. And, and, and my hearing is a really believable excuse. Except actually my hearing's pretty good right now. But when I don't want it to be, I can feign 74, you know, huh? What'd you say? Um, in reality, it means we didn't want to hear it. And when we don't listen, it's because we didn't want to hear. We don't want to hear the Lord, we don't listen. And if so much as a beast touch the mountain, it shall be stoned, verse 20, or thrust through with a dart. Um, and so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. Even Moses recognized this is, um, this is a terrible mountain uh, to approach. But look, look at the list. I have it listed here, uh, seven or eight things. Uh, you could do this in seven, but I, I, really think there's, uh, I really think there's about eight things. And so let's look at them. First of all, that you've come to a mountain that may be touched. Well, must be, must be very careful and that burned with fire. Now, when we say in, in, in uh, verse 18, uh, you've come unto the mount that might be touched or may be touched, we're talking about the fact that uh, it's, a real, it's a real experience. It's not a spiritual, uh, allegorical, it's a real experience. The law was real. You had to answer for the law. That may be touched and burned with fire and to blackness and darkness and tempest, and to the sound of a trumpet, so something to wake you up, to tell you, listen up, the voice of words, so they begged that the word should not be spoken to them, for they couldn't endure it. And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I'm exceedingly afraid and terrible. That's the mountain of the law, that's the Ten Commandments, that's good works, that's what it can do for you. So I say all that to say we are being brought to these two mountains to look at them and to consider them and to compare them. Now at the rapture, uh, we go past both these mountains. The first mountain we went past with Calvary at the cross. So this mountain is meant to be put behind us because of our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And this mountain has no role except to explain to us the seriousness of disobedience. But let's go on to the tranquil and glorious mountain. So let me take you on up to that. And we'll look at the tranquil, glorious mountain. And I think, I'm not sure if I can make this any larger i don't think that is that any larger for you or any better to read i hope so it's actually smaller right it's smaller okay i'm going to take it away then i can undo the things i do there we go all right That's good. thank you thank, thank you. you brother thanks a lot and so we're looking at the tranquility or the tranquilly glorious mountain the tranquility of this mountain the gloriousness of it, the awe of it, if you would, is a culmination of God's will. And we have to understand, before you can come to this mountain, you will have been saved, and you will have been raptured already. So this mountain is looking ahead. So let's read about this mountain a little bit. 
and we're going to look to verse 22. But you are come unto Mount Sion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. In verse 22, and to an innumerable company of angels. Verse 23, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the saints of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. So here's our list. We'll, we'll stop there for now. Here's our list, and we want to look through it. And, and I've got about nine things that, that I found in that list that we just read. Let's break it down a little bit. But first of all, let's recognize that the Mount Zion is not the city of Jerusalem. The Mount Zion that we're thinking of is the in history, the historic place where David had his home, it's where the throne was symbolically uh, held in Zion. It was a specific hill, but it spoke of the, the general area of, of uh, David's um, throne. And it is a, a, a term that is used to refer to the eternal throne of God and so Zion is the, the hope and the dream of all of Israel. So all through the Old Testament, they talked about Zion. They talked about the Messiah, the king, uh, and, and coming to Mount Zion. Notice that the difference. This is not Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah, where Abraham sacrificed Isaac, is where the temple is today, uh, or near it, depending on which version you believe in about where the temple is right now. But at any rate, it's not that mountain. It's not Mount Moriah. It's not Mount Calvary, and it's not Mount Sinai. So if you look at the mountains, then you put them behind you now. And it's very important that we understand that Mount Zion is representative of the, the reign of our Savior eternally, the, the fulfillment of the will of God uh, on earth and beyond for you'll see this is going to go far beyond this world but we'll see that a little bit later let's just come to mount zion and then to the city to the city of the living god the heavenly jerusalem and i thought we'd go to revelation chapter 21 and i've done this before with you uh but and i know your pastor has probably many times but I'd like us to read it again, if you don't mind. The verses 1 to 3 and verse 10. Then we'll jump down to verse 22. So 1 to 3. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. In other words, the presence of God is with men. He speaks of himself tabernacling with us. Uh, that's why we believe our God is personal. Our God is not distant. Our God is not like the gods of the, the Greeks and the Romans and the gods of the world and the gods of cults. Our God is personal. He in his personal and personable nature, wants a relationship with us. He wants to be among us. He tabernacles. So when it says, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, it means the, the present residing uh, of God is with men. So God is with us, and he is our God. And he will dwell with them. See the phrase? And they shall be his people, not just they will not just be religious followers or something. No, they're his people, his family. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. Verse 3 is just probably the most beautiful verse in the book of Revelation. And God said, wipe away all their tears. But I'm going to skip down for the sake of time. I want to watch my time in verse 10. And he carried me away in the spirit. This is John talking about uh, part of the book of Revelation. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven. Now, you might wonder which mountain he was on. Um, it's my opinion he was on Mount Zion. But, uh, you know, I, I went to Mount Zion and stood on it. 
And it is a little higher than the temple, but it's probably only maybe a hundred feet higher. Um, but it's already setting on Jerusalem, which is setting on a high range. So it, all of Jerusalem's a mountain, really. So, or on a mountain. So descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, and her light was like unto stone most precious, even of jasper stone, clear as crystal. And it goes on describing this in detail, but I want to go down to verse 22. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it. And the Lamb is the light thereof. You understand glory and glorious, and you understand some glory, much glory, most glory. Now you can see why I said it's the most glorious, because it is the glory of God himself. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. So just for now, we'll, we'll stop, go back to Hebrews, go back to chapter 12. Look at a little bit more of verse 22 here, if you don't mind. And we've looked at the mount. We've looked at the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem coming down. And if you think about this whole thing, oh, I know I was going to read Revelation 22 and I forgot verse 14. 22, 14 says this, blessed are they that do his commandments that they might have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into that city. And then verse 17, and the spirit and the bride say, come, and let him that heareth say, come, and whosoever will let him take of the water of life. This city is not exclusive. It's open to all who will believe. That's the point I wanted to make. And so as great as this city is and as glorious as it is, and Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And when I come again for you, we have this promise that will be there. Well, then also we have, um, whenever God's wanting to make a statement of glory, the glorious statement of God as a personal God is that he takes his creative power and has put it to good use, and he's created angels and seraphim and cherubim and others, and he's created human beings as well. And so he's gathering us to this glorious event. What makes an event glorious is not just the abstract glory of it, but the sharing of glory. Uh, the most wonderful thing about your salvation might be that you're saved. But the glory of this salvation is in the sharing of the message of salvation to your friends, your family, your neighbors, your children, as they see the glory of God in you. Then it has that effect of being glorious because glorious implies being shared. And so we see them sharing it now. The angels are there. They're there to praise and worship, and but they're there to experience the glory, the, the wonderful greatness of God, and to the general assembly. Now, panegyrus is a Greek word that is very important to this verse, because it's in panegyrus that we see the word assembly is used. And if you look down in your Bibles, you'll see it talks about to the general assembly in verse 23. Now, this general assembly has never met before, and as far as I know, it may never meet again. It's just meeting at this time, at the day of the Lord, at the coming of Christ. And Panegyrus is, is um, only mentioned, that word is only mentioned once in the Bible. And it speaks of a festive occasion. It's um, uh, a lot of fellows uh, would just leave it that way. I, I have my own opinion of it. I believe this is the marriage supper of the Lamb, but not everyone would agree with me. But, you know, they're welcome to be wrong. You know, I don't worry about that kind of thing. And uh, so if you look at Revelation chapter 19, let's take your Bibles. Now, if you're sitting out there, I can't check to see if you're getting your Bibles, but get your Bibles out. Remember what I told you, never trust an American. And uh, so Revelation chapter 19, verse 1, and maybe we'll even read to verse 10. After these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven 
saying, Alleluia, salvation, glory, and honor, and power under the Lord our God. This sounds to me very much like that same general assembly, but uh, other people have other ideas about it. For true and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Alleluia, and her smoke rose up forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia. And a voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants. You know, all ye his servants, I think this is the only place where all the servants of God are there at one time. And ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad. Let us be glad. You're going to see that word come up just in a minute. And rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. Now this gives me my chance to talk about the bride. And talk about the church. The church actually doesn't exist anymore. The church has been raptured. And in the rapture of the church, we've uh, had our bodies and we've had our spirits uh, put together. And, and those who were uh, preceded us in death, their bodies first and their spirits are united. We come right behind them. And if we're living at the time, we take our body and spirit in one piece and go. Um, it's sort of like gather up your luggage and move, and that's what we do. And so this is that marriage feast of the Lamb, I believe. If you go back to Revelation chapter 4, I don't have time to read all of it, but I just want to read a portion of Revelation 4, verse uh, 10. The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne, and worship him that liveth forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, thou, thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. And then you could go to chapter 5 and verse 11. And, uh, and I behold, and well, really verse 9. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for, for thou uh, wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by the blood out of every kindred tongue and people and nation and has made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth and I behold and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne oh there they are and the beast and the elders and the numbers of them was ten thousand ten thousand and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying, blessing and honor. This is really a general assembly in my opinion. And honor and glory and power be unto him that setteth upon the throne. And the throne symbolized in Zion and under the Lamb forever and ever. And the four and, uh, and uh, twenty beasts, no, get that right. And the four beasts said, uh, and the four and twenty elders fell down and worshiped him that liveth forever and ever. So I read all that as quickly as I can to put together the general assembly, the general panegyrus, the general festival, the greatest festival in all history, uh, a time of rejoicing, a time that is distinct from the idea of the church here on earth. Uh, we are an assembly, but we're an assembly that have been given a purpose of being a witness to Christ, being supportive of one another, building one another up, loving one another. We've been given pastors and deacons to uh, to uh, uh, develop us, uh, equip us is the word I was looking for, equip us to be able to grow in our spiritual unity with Christ and with one another. This is the goal. And the glory. Uh, I know a lot of people will tell you that the purpose of the church is to worship. 
but you'll see in a minute what I have to say. The purpose of the church is to serve. You think about that. Israel worshiped, we serve. And in a sense, Israel served as well. But let's just think about that. And that might just give you something to think about as we go a little bit further. Uh, so we get into the church of the firstborn. Now, I had you in Revelation chapter 22, but let's look before, let's read Hebrews chapter 12 now. And let's look at what it says as we uh, read right down to, um, uh, to um, uh, verse 23 at the bottom of it. Um, to the, and to God, the judge of all. All right, see that phrase? Look right before it. And, and the church of the firstborn. Now, I'd like to change that word church, if you don't mind, to ecclesia. Or ecclesia, as some like to pronounce it. Ecclesia. Ecclesia means assembly. So it's the assembly of the firstborn who are registered in heaven. Let's, let's go to Revelation chapter 22. And you'll see that's not the church. That's not your church. That's not, uh, is that the bride of Christ? No, bar, bride of Christ we've already identified. Is that the body of Christ? Well, the body of Christ operates here on earth uh, under his headship, but I don't think it's even the body of Christ, even though it's the same people. I don't think it's operationally the same, uh, practically the same. But anyway, at verse 22, verse, and, and we're going to look at verse, um, I, I have down there the wrong verse, 27. Let's look at verse 7. Um, let's see if that's where I want to be. I don't want to be there at all. I want to be at uh, 2127, I think. No, yes, I want to be at 2127, so that's a mistake right there. If I don't make a mistake in my sermon somewhere in my notes, then you know I didn't write it. My wife probably did. Um, verse 2127, and there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever work of abomination, or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. What's it talking about? Well, we go back, you know, we were reading about it before, and uh, verse 23 says, and the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. We read that already, but now we're reading. And verse 26, and they shall bring the glory and honor of all the nations into it, and there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they, they, that's who's going to be there, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. So I believe that though we are as the church uh, the bride of christ we are the body of christ and though we are a called out assembly of believers though we are all of those uses of the word, the word assembly and ecclesia this is a reference this is a reference to an assembly of the firstborn there right there at this uh, great day at mount zion um will all be uh, focused around this moment and uh, uh, who's going to be there from, from the age of grace? Who's going to be there from this time? Everybody who was a member of a church? No, church membership doesn't uh, get you there. Everybody who's been baptized? No, baptism doesn't get you there. Everyone who's done good works? No, good works won't get you there. The only thing that's going to get you there is to be born again. And the word firstborn, maybe that confuses you. Let me explain. It's the same thing as in Colossians. Um, it's a reference to in priority. You're the first born in priority, not the first in order. And so the, the Greek uh, would say that a little bit different if it were written out in English um, in more clarity. I, I think you might find the Amplified would help you. But, but at any rate, then we read it's to God, the judge of all. Hebrews 4.14 uh, and 16 is, to me, one of the classic and beautiful verses uh, in Hebrews. And so we're going to go there and read it, 4.14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. 
For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. I, I consider that word touched and compare it to the mosaic uh, Mount Sinai and the, the fact that touching that mountain could uh, cost you your life. Well, our Savior can be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He does understand. Uh, he's not holding his hand off or away from us, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Verse 16, let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. See that phrase, the throne of grace? Well, I do believe you are there, the God, the judge of all. The world would be petrified if it had to face the God who is the judge of all. And it will face him at the great white throne judgment. And our savior Jesus Christ will sit on that throne and judge that white, from that white throne. And we will be gathered behind him, but we will not face the judge in judgment. Our judgment was on the cross of Christ. When Jesus Christ died, he paid our penalty. He took our judgment and we are not to be judged. The judge of all that it refers to includes us, we're the all, but our judgment has been paid in Christ. To the spirits of just men made perfect. Now, uh, there are different opinions about this, but most everyone's agreed this is talking about the Old Testament saints who are there. Uh, why are they different? Well, they're different than the firstborn who are registered in heaven, but they're not different in the sense that their names also, if you look all through the Old Testament, their names are written in the book of life. So they're the just men made perfect. You see, when were they made perfect? They were made perfect at the time that Jesus died for them. But before that, they were men who were righteous men, just men who were obeying God and doing what he said to do and listening to him and placing their faith in him. And what was the basis of their justice? We know from Abraham, we know from Romans 4, summarizing the life and ministry of Abraham, that when he, God, declares us just on the basis of the faith he sees we have in him, we're made righteousness, we're made justified, we're justified, and that's that crowd right there, we believe. And then we go on, verse 24, verse 24. I guess I better go back to Hebrews 12 if I'm going to preach on verse 24. Okay. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. Now, we want to be careful about the word mediation. In this sense, he's testator. He is the one who is the, the object of, of the new covenant. Uh, the new covenant is built around him and around his work and what he does on the cross and in and, and his spirit and, and the spirit of the Lord, uh, of, the, of God, is active. And when Jesus dies, he mediates the new covenant. In other words, he puts it into effect. When he died on the cross, he put the new covenant into effect. Now, there's another thing that Jesus is our mediator sitting at the right hand of the Father. But that's a different use of the phrase here. To Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant is a reference to his death on the cross and to the blood of sprinkling. Now, the blood of sprinkling is, is very important because the blood of sprinkling was, um, was a religious act. It was the religious act that brought about the cleansing and the removal of guilt. And so we know that from Abel, that Abel sprinkled the blood. And we know that at, uh, in, in uh, Egypt, the children of Israel sprinkled the blood. And we know sprinkling of blood is, is symbolic and important to the whole idea of our uh, life in, in, with God and our walk with God and that we live lives that are, are clean. And he makes a point he makes a very good point that all the way back to Abel, the, the sprinkling of blood that we know that Abel did, uh, even though he was later killed by his brother, uh, that, that act of faith, as wonderful as it is, the blood is, that Christ offers is unlike that which Abel offered. Christ's blood 
expiates. It does what? It expiates. There's a good word for you. Expiate. It atones for. It pays for. It redeems. It takes away our sin and our guilt. Look at 1 John chapter 1. Let's go over in your Bibles. Just past 2 Peter, 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. Brethren, I write a new commandment to you. Oh, wrong chapter. Okay. But if we walk in the light, there it is, John 1, 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. This is the subject. The subject is fellowship, not salvation now, but fellowship, our daily walk, our daily walk. Abel was not just taking care of his salvation. Salvation was taken care of by faith. His walk with God was the issue here. And it is for us too. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Well, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. My little children, these things write I unto you, let you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, the replacing payment, and not for ours only, but for also for the sins of the whole world. Well, let's go back to Hebrews chapter 12 because I've got to watch my time. I have no idea what time it is. Oh, my goodness. Okay. I really do have to watch my time. All right. We've got to finish this sermon up. And let's go on to the close of this sermon. Let's look at verse 25. See that, we, see that ye refuse not him that speaketh. Now, this is a warning to the writer of Hebrews. There's a lot of opinions about who wrote Hebrews. Um, Paul, Timothy, um, I will go, a Barnabas, some say. Uh, I go with Apollos, uh, but whoever you want to choose, you're welcome to choose because nobody knows. And so the writer might have been Apollos, and, um, and he's writing here to what city? Well, to the Jews, but where was the central city where the Jews were? Believe it or not, Rome. It was Rome until Rome burned, but after that, of course, not so, but this book was written during that time and probably most likely was sent to Rome and uh, where the Jews, Jewish believers were. There were seven Jewish synagogues in Rome and five of them had become the synagogues of believers. Can you imagine that? That's an amazing thing. So the Jews were five to two outnumbered by believing Jews. Ah, that's an amazing thought. Anyway, uh, verse uh, 25, see that you do not refuse him. See that you do not refuse him. Wow. Who would do that? Well, a lot of people would do that. Uh, see that you do not refuse him who speaks. You read uh, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, 2, and 3, and think about that. For if they did not escape who refused him, who spoke on earth, read chapter 2 and 3 of Hebrews, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth. But now he's promised saying, yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. This idea of shaking, I don't know if you thought about it, but the idea of shaking is, is a term, it, it's, a, it's a particular Greek word that, that is used, and, and I didn't know if I should spend much time. Metathesis is the removal. It's, it's shaking something until it falls away. And uh, I remember I, we lived on Air Force bases or near them uh, all my life as a boy, and, and we had to tape our knickknacks, like we'd have knickknacks up on the, on the bookshelf, well, we'd have to tape them or uh, putty them or nail them to, to whatever, because when the, the planes would come in, big bombers would come in and big tankers coming in about the refueling jets, they'd shake our house so bad the stuff would fall off the, the, the shelves. 
And so the shaking really, I, I feel it. I can tell you, I feel the shaking even now. I can remember the shaking. When my uncle came to visit us, he said he couldn't sleep in our house because the bed shook at night. Every hour, another plane would come in. Yet once more indicates a shaking, a removal. But it also is a revalued life. Are you revaluing your life? I'm asking you to. I'm telling you this scripture is telling you to. Don't refuse him who speaks because he's shaking the earth and he's changing everything around it. I don't have time for all these scriptures. Let's just go to Psalm 68, all right? I wish I could take you to all of them, but you know I'm running over time and I'm sorry for that. Psalm 68 and, um, uh, and we'll just read verse eight and nine. All right, 68.8, if I get the right page here, 68.8, the earth shook, the heavens also dropped in the presence of God, even Sinai itself was moved at the presence of God, the God of Israel. Do you hear that? Thou, O God, descend a plentiful rain, whereby, whereby thou didst confirm thine inheritance when it was weary. God shakes people up to wake them up. But let me read to you from Haggai, all right? Haggai. Now, if you don't know where Haggai is, because it's probably not one of your most favorite books, it's right after Zephaniah, just before Zechariah. And if that's not one of your favorite books, go to Matthew and start backing up about 20 pages from Matthew. You'll go by Malachi, Zechariah, and then you'll come to Haggai. Haggai, a very interesting book, but we're not going to get into that. I want to read verse 10. Therefore, the heavens over you is stayed with dew. Now think about this. And the earth is stayed from her fruit. Go to chapter 2, verse 6. And this is really where it gets down to the issue. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, yet once it is a little while and I will shake the heavens. So you might get comfortable with the nice, beautiful weather we're having right now. Now is sunny outside today, but the Lord says, we have, once it is a little while and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. God says, I'll shake this whole thing down. I invite you to take your Bible to Second Peter chapter 3. Second Peter chapter 3. Another very important verse about shaking. All right. We're going to see it coming up now in verse 28 as well, but I'm getting ahead of myself just a little bit. So Second Peter chapter, uh, chapter 3, and as you read Second Peter 3, uh, we'll read from, um, I guess, verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting into the coming of the day of God. The day of God is uh, uh, the summary statement for this whole period, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. Uh, th there's so much we could say. I, I think it's important that I say to you that we take the warning that God has made a change. He made a change at the first mount. He made the second on Mount Calvary. He's now making a third change. And the warning goes in the book of Hebrews, you better pay attention to these changes. God is not leaving things the way you know them. God is moving things around. And in uh, Hebrews chapter 10, if you don't mind going to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26. Hebrews 10, 26. We read these words, for then he must often, oops, wrong one, 1026, next page, okay. 
For if we sin willfully after that we've received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Now you could try the Catholic Church, they keep sacrificing Christ every Sunday, but this verse says there is no more sacrifice, so they're, a waste, they're wasting their time. But a certain fearful looking for of judgment is what you can expect if you ignore God, which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Verse 29, of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite under the Spirit of grace. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And so powerful scripture verses. Uh, go back to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. You were in chapter 3 when we started in our introduction. Now in this summary and this conclusion, we're looking at chapter 4, and we're looking at the very last verse, verse 18. While we look not at things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And go back to verse 16 and get the context. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish. And sometimes the way things are going right now, you might feel your outward man is perishing. Yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, that's what God thinks of uh, COVID-19 and lockdown. Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. So my argument was, see to it that you hear. My argument was revalue life. Look at the fact that things have been shaken down. Not this word. Now this word, verse 27, read it. Now this word, yet once more, indicates the removal. It, it's a very interesting thing, this word, uh, metathesis, meaning uh, uh, the idea of transferring from one way of doing things to another. He says the removal of those things uh, that are shaken. It's not just getting rid of them, but putting something in place, putting off and putting on the things which cannot be shaken may remain. And that's Zion. That's what we were reading before. Now the church's graduates, that's what I call this, uh, this crowd in verse 28. Therefore, since we're receiving a kingdom, uh, we're not the church anymore. Church is gone. Uh, no more pastors, no more deacons, uh, none of that. Um, but same people, we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken. And you think of Abraham uh, and you think about uh, his great faith. It's not Hebrews 1.10, it's Hebrews 11.10, second mistake. Hebrews 11.10, Abraham says, for he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Are you looking for that city? Well, he was. Let us have grace by which we may serve God. Now, this word uh, uh, is, is an important word. La trio is serving God. Uh, worshiping is not just putting your hands up. It's not just saying prayers. It's not even just reading your Bible. Uh, if you say you have faith, James says you better have works with it. Uh, service to God is worship to God. You witness to people. You help others. You live for the Lord. That's, that's for us who are believers. Uh, but anyway, not out of compulsion. That's the whole idea of Latruna, Latrua. Uh, very important. Let, think about it. Let us have grace by which we may serve God. So you won't serve God without grace. In Second uh, Corinthians 4.1, he says we would faint if we didn't have mercy and grace from God. We may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Uh, by the way, that word um, godly fear really translates out uh, gratitude, with gratitude. 
And that's the idea of godly fear. A godly fear has gratitude. And then it closes with a really difficult verse from Deuteronomy 4.24. It closes, for our God is a consuming fire. I, I think the, the, the closing of this chapter and the closing of this sermon is such that uh, the writer under the leadership of the Holy Spirit wants to make it very clear. We have a great opportunity, a beautiful opportunity to see this wonderful experience of Mount Zion, this tranquilly glorious mountain. What a beautiful mountain. All that blessing. But if you're not going to take it serious, you must remember our God is a consuming fire. I give it back to you, uh, Pastor, or the leader, to have prayer or carry the service further. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Mark. Um, I don't know about everybody else, but I think we'll need a bit more time to go through this. So fortunately, this has been recorded, and you can uh, look at it again later today and just uh, maybe meditate on it a bit further. Um, there's a lot to think about and a lot of blessing in, in what we've been through this morning. So thank you again, Pastor Mark. Very well. Um, we're going to skip the last hymn and uh, just uh, enjoy a time of fellowship for those who would like to switch on their cameras and uh, spend a few moments. I'm sure there's some greetings that are about to go on. So. David, will you close? Yeah, Thanks, brother. Yes. Sure. Let's pray. Lord, we're so grateful for what you've done for us. And we, we thank you for this time that we've been able to spend together and just look deeper into the deep blessings that you've won for us, that you've bought for us, that we can be part of as your people and that ultimately we will be able to join in that great assembly and and just uh, enjoy that that time of fellowship and celebration as we look to you as the one who has done this for us. Thank you so much for for who you are, for you, what you've done and as we began this morning, we just are in awe of of that and of you and of the fact that you would consider us and that you would give us a part in this, that you would adopt us into this. We praise you for this and we, we honor you. As we go on to, into this week, we pray that we would remember this and we would live in light of this. As we serve those around us we pray that you would just give us your your peace and your your strength in in what we have to do and and how we do it for you we thank you again for this amen <laughs>